Question. Do you know how to say, I want? I want this, I want that. We're pretty good at that, aren't we? The scriptures are interesting because the scriptures say, want the better things. Did you know that? If you'll take a look at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right at the end of it, it says, earnestly desire and want the better things, the more important things. So we can understand people saying, I want. Another part of our lives is to say, I need. I need this or I need that. And some of that's quite legitimate because there are certain basic needs that we have in our lives. Uh, most of us go way beyond needs to wants. But I can remember how people can turn that trick too. Um, our youngest, Shelly, used to always say when she wanted a Three Musketeers candy bar, but Daddy, I really need that candy bar, you know. And being a strong and able father, I would say, give it to her. But there's another reality that really does touch us, and it comes from another place altogether, another space altogether, and that is I ought. And you and I are, as spiritual men and women, at the point that ought becomes a part of our lives. Think of it. I want, I need centers in myself. I ought almost inevitably centers beyond myself, calls me to others, calls me to responsibilities, calls me to a dirty word in the church, duty. And so this passage of scripture is interesting. Actually, one of the theology professors wrote a letter to Luke who wrote this passage. And the gist of the letter that he wrote was this. Dear Luke, I like a lot of the things that you've written. I like the nativity story in chapter 2. And I like that story in chapter 24 about the road to Emmaus and those two guys that Jesus met. But I do not like this story about the servant. And I'm surprised at you. You should have done better. <laughs> I don't know about you, but every now and then when I run into a challenging portion of the scripture, the easiest thing to do is just skip it and preach on something else. But what this passage says to us is so very important. Let's look at it. And the very first thing it suggests is this. Work the faith that you've got. Did you notice how it says increase our faith or give us a little bit more faith? And Jesus says, this is his answer. Is faith like coffee on the shelf in the store? You go and buy whatever number of pounds you want. Is faith a commodity or is faith somehow a gift? Isn't faith something that is given to you that you take responsibility for and some people seem to have a bigger hunk than other people. I don't know how that works. I don't even know why. But what I do know is this, that you have to work the faith you've got. You may not be able to see everything clearly. You may not be able to see everything plainly, but you can see enough for you to take a primary step and begin to move in directions that you know you should. And when you say, I am going to move as I ought or as I should, then your faith is beginning to work. There are no great saints that have all of what they're supposed to do with life set out before them. And I'm not saying that this is a salvation by doing good works. What I'm saying is because God has loved you, because God has given you grace, because God has given us forgiveness, because God is a God of mercy, because God has loved us to the point that God will do whatever is necessary for us to find our way to God, then we respond in faith with thanks and with works. And so what I think this passage of Scripture is saying is if you don't understand everything, work on what you do understand and work to the fullest of your capacity. Work with the faith that you've got that's already been given to you, that's already been delegated to you. And the next thing it says is be a faithful and humble disciple. I know a lot of disciples that are faithful but not humble. I know a lot of disciples that are humble but not faithful. I know a lot of disciples that are arrogant as the devil. I know a lot of disciples, including preacher types, that are as plastic as a plastic rose. I mean, there is no substance. There is no deep discipleship. Discipleship has to do with learning. And if you want to understand what scriptures are about, if you want to understand what faith is about, then what you have to do is spend some time learning on it. You know, it's always amusing to me people to say, Methodists don't know anything about the scripture. I wish Methodists would study the scripture a little bit more. You know what? We got a lot of room on Wednesday night at prayer meeting when we studied the scripture. We got a good bit of room on Sunday night. You wouldn't believe that. But the church is not real full on Sunday night. When we actually do a little teaching from scripture. 
And we have the most wonderful Bible study I know anything about called Disciple Bible Studies. Let me tell you why it's wonderful. It does not shove things down your throat, but teaches you how to think biblically. Doesn't try to propagandize you. Tries to say, look at the scriptures and find the word of God that is powerfully present there. And for as many people as do, they find it. And so lots of people have this ideal, you know, I want to know more about the Bible, but nobody wants to take time. Discipleship means taking time. Discipleship means making oneself available. I'm not talking about necessarily coming to the Sunday night service or to Wednesday night, although it would really be wonderful. It would just be great to see you. But I'm talking about saying, if I want to grow in spirit and in truth, then I have to work on spirit and truth. I was looking just the other day at one of these machines that will make you beautiful in four minutes. Have you all seen that one? I keep up with these things. Anthony Robbins recommends this machine. You only have to work out four minutes and 15 seconds a day and you will be beautiful. Uh, whatever that is. For boys, more masculine. For girls, more feminine and all that kind of stuff. And, you'll be, and the machine is only $14,645. I kid, I kid you not. You've seen this. You've seen this machine. Some of you have seen this thing. You know, that's the kind of discipleship some people want. God, you've got four minutes a day. And don't ask me, ask me for any more because I'm busy, God. You know? <laughs> you know, God, a thousand years in God's sight are just like the night passed. And this man said, God, you've got to help me and deliver me from this right now. And that's the first time he prayed in 40 years. And God said, wait a minute. <laughs> I think that really is funny. But anyway. So what this passage I think is saying to us is that you got to work the faith that you've got. It's not a commodity. And that what you have to do is to allow your discipleship to develop and to do the investing that's necessary for your discipleship to investment. There is nothing that you want to do with your life. Listen to me. I don't care if you're young or old or in between. There's nothing that you want to do with your life that will not be increased and perfected if you give more time to it, if you invest more of yourself in it. And that's what this is all about. It's saying that duty in itself is powerful. That duty is not something to be put down. You know, I was raised in a family where you did your duty, whether you liked it or not. And most of the time, I didn't like it. But we not only did our duty, but we did it at a specific time. We ate supper at 5.30 in the evening, not 5.29 and not 5.31. And if you got there at 5.31, you missed the first part. Everybody was expected to take care of his or her responsibilities around the house to do your chores. You know what? We hurt ourselves a lot by giving so many things to our loved ones. Listen to me. Giving so many things to our loved ones, expecting nothing from our loved ones, and then being very upset and disappointed because they don't take responsibility well. Like the 18-year-old high school senior who says, Daddy, I've graduated from high school. I've gone everywhere I want to go. I've bought everything I want to buy. I've done everything I want to do. Now, Daddy, give me a reason for getting up tomorrow morning. You see, there's a power to oughtness and there's a power to duty. One more thing and we're done. What's the reward of it all? Did you notice this? The reward of it? You see what Jesus said? He said the reward is you did it. But what else? You did it. But what more? You did it. But that's not enough. Why? Why? Isn't that what it's all about? What's the chief end of education? To be educated. What is the chief end of spiritual life? To become more spiritual. What is the reward of anything that we do but the fact that we've done it? Some of you all have heard this story, but you haven't heard the last part of it. When I was called to preach, my daddy said to me, my God, there's no future in it. <laughs> and... Uh, but, you know, it was later, and this is the part that I don't think I've ever shared. It was later that my daddy, he was the first person that ever came to me and said, understand that you don't get a great deal out of preaching, he said, but I understand that the retirement is out of this world. <laughs> you all have heard that. It's a cliche. It's a very, very old thing, you know. And the retirement is out of this world, you know. God gives us a great, a great deal uh, of reward, you know. I mean, listen to the reward. Uh, people say, how much? What kind of? Here it is. Well done. You did a good job. 
on Thanksgiving Sunday, what about the eternal God looking you in the face, looking me in the face and saying, I really want to thank you. I want to say thanks to you for you. That's the reward. I want, I need, I ought. When we ought, everything changes. And we move closer to the kingdom. God help us to understand the power of oughtness in times like these. Amen. Let's pray. God, we want to open ourselves right now in just this brief moment to see what it is that you want from us and to say thanks a lot for letting us just be humble disciples. There's nothing wrong at all with us serving you at the table. God, we're even willing to wait until you drink your coffee. Help us to find our place and to take it and to take it with both courage and conviction and to somehow baptize it until it becomes something of beauty and a reward in itself. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing song is just one verse.